Tonight we're in 1 Corinthians in chapter chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now you may, uh, if you're paying careful attention, you may think, well, we were in chapter 10 last week. What happened in chapter 11? Well, I was just afraid to preach chapter 11, so we're just going to skip right over it and uh, go to chapter 12. So, now we had Lord's Supper a couple of weeks ago, and we preached a large part of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And you can't preach every single verse when you're preaching through a portion of the Scripture. But uh, we did cover that a little bit um, out of order, but we did cover it. So, By the way, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday morning you want to be here. Uh, we're going to be preaching a really, really timely message. A lot of people are really uh, confused about end time events because there's just so much diverse uh, teaching. And uh, it's, it's one of those matters where every believer can know what the Word of God says about the next event on God's calendar. And we're going to be able to see a lot of the future events in Revelation chapter 7 coming up this uh, Sunday morning. And you'll want to make sure, if you can't be here, you want to make sure to uh, look at that message online on YouTube. And there should be a PDF as well included along with it of uh, some just uh, more information that can be preached in about 45 minutes or so. And so I want to let you know about that. We Last week we deviated a little bit from our, from our uh, exposition through Revelation because there's just too much material and we need to be able to handle it in an organized fashion. So I want to just give you a little plug for that for Sunday morning's uh, message. And we're looking forward to that. Are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 now? Yeah. Okay, very good. Let's just read verses 1 through 7. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. By the way, the use of the word dumb there is used in this sense of the word. It's not an insulting word. It means they can't speak. They can't hear. They are not animated. They're not alive. So that's what the word dumb means in case you're ready to get offended and you think that Paul was using the word dumb. No, he was an apostle, not a pastor. Only pastors can use the word dumb, so Paul is not guilty. Verse 3, Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say, that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Father, please help tonight for us to have understanding. God, I pray that you would give us simplicity as we uh, just go through the flow of this text this evening, which is written to be understood in a very, very practical sense. And I pray that you would help us practically to be able to apply what we read and what we see in the next couple of weeks. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, in this portion of the Scripture, we are actually, when you see uh, Paul's introduction to the topic, he, he obviously introduces a new topic now concerning spiritual gifts. So we're going to be talking about what? Spiritual, spiritual gifts. gifts. And uh, this, is, this is so clearly, so plainly laid out that a believer doesn't have to be unclear about God's opinion, about the ministry of the person of God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. You know, there are just there are a lot of actions, activities, and behaviors that uh, are just so different from church to church, right? Uh, you, you ever notice how different churches are? I mean, just I mean, you could find you know churches that define what they are the way that we do. For instance, we're Baptist church. Our church is Baptist. Now, that's not denominational. Uh, Baptist is because we hold to the Baptist distinctives. So it's doctrinal. I'd like to uh, tell people that. Now, there are some Baptists who are denominationally Baptist, but we're not. Uh, traditionally speaking, uh, you say, well, we're the, we're the Baptist in the Bible. Well, they're just Bible believers. That's what Baptists actually are. Uh, but Baptists got called Baptists because they baptize. And where is that taught at? Well, it's taught in the Bible, right? And so Baptists were called Baptist. And it was a derogatory term. You know, you're a bunch of Baptists. 
you know, baptizers, people who baptize. And, uh, but the thing about it is, is it's true. <laughs> um, well, just don't get offended. I won't have to worry about it. Uh, it's fun to call people things, even if they're true. Uh, a, a, a term that is very much fun, you can label anybody. If, you wanna, if you're mean like I am, you want to just use a label for someone, you want to just press buttons, call someone a Trump supporter. Amen. Call someone a Trump supporter, and if they are, it's fine. Uh, but it's just they're just you could be a Trump supporter, and there's something about being called it that it just is really an offensive thing. Matter of fact, <laughs> um, when people are behaving badly, that's usually my recourse. I just call them Trump supporters. Uh, let me give you for instance. Now you're gonna. I hope you still like me afterward. My brother and I were in Home Depot this last year. And we were behind this guy who was just angry as all get out. And he was just angry and he was yelling at everybody and, and he was being really impolite. He cut in line first of all. He cut in front of several of us. And then and he wanted to get a drink out of the cooler and so he reached behind, like just kind of pushed us out of the way and got in the cooler and got a thing. And this one guy says something to the guy and he turned around and just cursed at, the, at the guy, another guy in line. And the other guy says, what is his problem? And I said, he's a Trump supporter. <laughs> and I mean, it set him off. I mean, it just really, it was like really pushed the buttons. I am not a Trump supporter. That's the last thing in the world I ever, I said, well, I just believe you are. <laughs> and so you want to have some fun. That's free. You, you have to pay me a dollar every time you use it and have a good time. That ought to be a dollar's worth of laughs for you. But, uh, you know, if you're a Trump supporter, uh, brother, <laughs> brother Al Miller, we were down in Miami. Uh, in 2016, we were in Miami Beach, and Miami's just, you know, Miami Beach is not necessarily a Trump stronghold, I don't think. I'm not sure about that. But we were in Taco Bell, and you know Brother Al, he's very, very tall, and he's in his 60s, and he's very, very Caucasian. And this guy walks up to him and goes, are you a Trump supporter? <laughs> and that's where I got the idea of it. I'm just thinking, man, you're talking about stereotyping a guy. And uh, anyway, so... That's where it came from. But the reality of it is Brother Al was a Trump supporter. And guess what? I'm not sure he wanted to be labeled that way, but it was true. And so if the label fits, wear it, right? If you're a Trump supporter, just go ahead and put the sticker on your truck and, and buy new tires when everybody slashes them. So <laughs> no problem at all. Go ahead and just claim it. All right, so listen to me tonight. A Baptist is similar, derogatory. In other words, if somebody called you a Baptist, it was, you know, you don't, you're not part of the organization, the organized church. You're a Baptist. And Baptists baptize because the Bible teaches that. Baptists believe this real quickly. If, if you uh, don't know the acrostic and you want to jot it down so you can remember it, Baptists believe B, Bible authority. In other words, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God it claims to be. And we believe that if anyone teaches anything that the Bible doesn't teach, then they don't have the authority to teach that. And we believe that if we believe something and the Bible contradicts it, then we have to come under Bible authority. Whatever the Bible teaches, that's what I believe. That's my doctrinal statement. I've had people say, you know, there, you know, there's no record of anybody believing that. Well, here's a really good one. In other words, a lot of the things Baptists believe are not articulated uh, by a uh, church father. Why is that? Well, because... They didn't have to write it because it was already written. You understand that? In other words, uh, the, one of the things that I realized some years ago is the more untrue something is, the bigger book it takes to defend it. The bigger book it takes to articulate it, right? Like the, the more made up it is, the more angles you have to present it from and the more uh, sources you have to quote and so forth because Calvinism. it's made up. What's that? Calvinism. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have about volumes about this wide. To, to articulate Calvinism because it's not biblical. And uh, Bible authority is something Baptists believe. Autonomy. Autonomy is something, if you looked up our website and you were looking for an independent Baptist church, autonomy is another word for the word that we use for independent. Which we're not part of an association or a denomination. I tell people a lot of times, Baptists were um, independent or Baptists were non-denominational way before it was cool to be non-denominational. Now, now there's like non-denominational churches everywhere. 
And they're actually not honest about it, most of them. Some of them are. Some of them really aren't denominational. But you, if you go by a lot of churches, they have a label on the sign, but they usually are part of a denomination. Uh, throw out some names of churches within a couple mile radius of here. Calvary Chapel. Okay, Calvary Chapel. It's a denomination. Grace, Point. Grace, Point. Grace Point. Grace Point Southern Baptist. Christ okay, Church. Uh, Christ Church is Methodist. Uh, in other words, they have uh, generic names. There's another Grace on uh, McNabb, and that's uh, that's Reformed Baptist. Uh, anyway, there are a lot of churches that are pretending to be non-denominational, but actually they're part of a denomination. Baptists say we're Baptists, which means we are not part of a denomination autonomous. P, B, uh, Bible authority, A, autonomy, P, uh, we believe in the priesthood of the believers. Uh, we don't have a priest. We have a church full of them. God can speak to you, and God can speak through you because you have the Spirit of God living in you. You're a believer priest. Some Baptists are bad about it, but a, a, a person who really is Baptist recognizes that God speaks through everybody who is a believer. And so when you come to me and, and the Holy Spirit of God is showing you something, man, I need to listen because God speaks through you. That's what I love about church business meetings in our church. I love to get the believer priests together and listen to what God is saying to our people. And uh, it's amazing how when, uh, when you're in fellowship with the Lord, how much unity there is in that. So priesthood of the believers. Uh, we believe in uh, uh, two ordinances. Two ordinances. Uh, the Lord's Supper and uh, the uh, washing of feet. <laughs> uh, baptism. Baptism is the other one. There are some folks that believe that because... Jesus said if we want to be servants that we should, you know, serve each other, wash each other's feet, and that sort of thing. Uh, foot washing is, is, our equivalent of foot washing today is more like toilet cleaning. Uh, if you're, it, it, you know, it's, it's serving each other. And I'm being a little bit silly with it this evening, but the idea is, is that people used to have pretty disgusting feet, and, uh, you know, they had to have their feet washed, and to wash someone's feet, people still have disgusting feet, but there's no reason for it in the day and age in which we live, I'll have you know. Uh, but but uh, we're really off on something, aren't we? My wife's laughing. Like, get back in the Bible, or you're going to be in trouble. Okay. Uh, but to to do something to there was something you do to serve someone. You would host somebody. You'd wash their feet, and it was showed that you were you would serve them. And that's the attitude believers are supposed to have toward each other. We're supposed to serve one another. It's not one of the ordinances of the Baptist. In case you don't know, I was being silly there. Um, individual atonement. I B A P T I individual atonement. You cannot pray for your loved one to be born again, and I cannot do anything on your behalf for your salvation. I cannot baptize you when you're an infant, and you'll have atonement. No, you have to trust Jesus as your Savior. God does not force anyone into heaven, and He invites everyone who will be saved. And so it's a choice of the will. It's an individual choice. Uh, you're not Baptist because you're born Baptist. Sometimes I'll hear people, you know, when I used to be in the South, uh, up South from here, that was one of the things, everybody's Baptist, and they'd say, well, how'd you get to be Baptist? they say, well, I was born Baptist. I thought, no, you're not Baptist, because Baptists believe in individual atonement. No one's born a Baptist. You're born again, and that's how you become saved. And then saved church membership, S, saved church membership. Now, you could be on the roll of the church. My great aunt, who didn't get born again until she was 100 years old, uh, used to show us her cradle roll from the Baptist Church's Sunday school class from when she was a child. And she trusted that for her salvation. She felt as though being enrolled in the Sunday school uh, was a validation of her eternal life, and she never felt that it was necessary to trust Jesus until right at the end of her life. And then she began to really think, what am I going to do when I meet the Lord Jesus? And she wanted to be born again. She sent for me. She uh, she knew that I was coming and she kept asking my mom when I was going to uh, come see her. We walked down the hallway and literally before we went into her room, she was 100, she wore hearing aids, but she had them out, and she yelled at me, I need you to make sure that I know I'm going to heaven. And uh, she trusted Jesus that night. Individual atonement, being part of the Sunday school class or baptized as a baby, uh, doesn't save you. Save church membership is the only way that you can be part of the church is by being born again.
And then the Baptists believe in the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. T, the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. You could study that in a lot of places in the Bible. Study the plural names for God. Study the references where Jesus uh, made very, 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 very assertive statements that he was God. Look at the beginning, the first verse in the Bible where the Bible says in the beginning, God, Elohim, God plural, uh, created the heaven and the earth. God is uh, the Godhead. There's, he's, he is, we're made in God's image in order to be able to have fellowship with him, but there's nobody like God. You want to understand the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity, it's an attempt in futility, my friend. You can read what the Bible says about it, and you can believe what the Bible says. There are a lot of things that, about God that you will not understand because God is different than us. You're not eternal. You cannot relate to God's eternal Godhead, His eternal nature. Uh, but God is eternal. Uh, you're not a creator, so you can't relate to God in that way. But you can relate to God through Jesus Christ and by having His Spirit live in you. So, having said all of that, we are Baptists. You ever wonder how churches came to be so different? I've been in a lot of Baptist churches. Never been in one that was like exactly like any other. Now, sometimes I'll visit a Baptist church and somebody asks me, what is that church like? And I'll try to think of another church they know about that I can say, well, it's kind of like this one. But they're all different uh, as far as the personality of a church, just like people are all different. But doctrine is what makes a person Baptist. What we teach, what we believe, is what makes us Baptist. Not uh, the way that we sing or the way that we look or the way that we dress or anything like that. It's doctrinal. Uh, having said that, there are people that are Baptists who don't know it. There are people who are Baptists, but they don't know they're Baptists. They say, oh, I'm not denominational. Well, do you believe the Baptist distinctives? Well, then you're just as Baptist as the first people that got called Baptist. You see, and it's just a term. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, you know, you, it's, it, you don't live and die for a term. But terms are important, and I think it's good to define oneself, don't you? Because I don't think it's very honest to try to hide what we are and then try to be sneaky about what we teach just so that some person that maybe wouldn't agree with us will still come and still be part of our fellowship uh, in spite of what we believe. And so that's, uh, that's being Baptist. Now, you ever been to a charismatic church? Yeah. Been to a charismatic church? Yeah. I have. Now, some of y'all, it may fit your personality. My grandma was a charismatic when she was born. Like, she's born charismatic. Like, she did, she had charismatic hand. My grandma's just charismatic. I'm just talking about her personality, not her doctrine. But she's a natural born charismatic. And now me, I remember the first time I went into a, a charismatic church, and I'm not making fun here this evening very much. I just want to illustrate a little bit. I remember being about uh, five or six years old, maybe young, now probably five or six. And uh, for whatever reason, we visited a church in the morning uh, morning service, and I remember going to Sunday school class, and I don't remember what the Sunday school lesson was, but a lady had a whole tray of sugar, and she was using it for sand to make something. I, don't, I remember that. I remember the sugar tray, sort of like I remember sheep that uh, have cotton puffs glued on them, and that sort of thing. But I remember that, and then I remember going into the Sunday morning service, and, and uh, you know, it started slow, and it kind of just whoosh, ramped up from there. We were, we were all the way in the back, like every good visitor ought to be, and uh, <laughs> They had a stand for a song, and, and t people started doing the, you know, the motions. And pretty soon, you know, uh, mostly the ladies were, you know, they were dancing, they were carrying on, doing some things. And then this one lady started going, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. And then it just, and then everybody just started doing something different. All of a sudden, this guy gets up and starts going, you know, some of want to buy a Hyundai, and uh, I need, I need uh uh, Tony here to um, to do the uh, tongues for me. This guy starts, blah, 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 and then pretty soon everybody's just like babbling. Just the whole place is just. <laughs> and uh, I'm little, you know. I'm just a little kid. I'm just thinking, this is not. This these ain't my people. Right? This is not very comfortable for me. I don't fit very well with all of this. And uh, a few other times, I ended up being in uh, charismatic churches, and I realized that, that they act and behave differently. And I'll be honest with you. If I had my druthers and I got to pick my religion style, I'd never pick to be a charismatic. I just don't like it. I don't like the behavior. I don't like how everybody seems like they're trying uh, for attention. I don't like the disorder of it. It just frustrates me. You know, it, it, the services take hours. Now, they only go to church once a week, and most of them only show up once a month. But it just takes forever. And it's just, uh, they, 
you know, and then people start getting up and talking, and there's just it's just total chaos, in my opinion. And I just it just doesn't feel good for me. I remember reading some years ago John Rice's book, The Power of Pentecost, and he was talking about how that after he preached a revival, John Rice saw hundreds of thousands of people come to know Jesus in his revival crusades. You could read old New York City newspapers when he would have a crusade in the city of New York, and, and literally in the tabernacles they would erect. The entire cities would come out, New York, Chicago, uh, all these big cities. He saw hundreds of thousands of people come to know Jesus. And literally, the Great Awakening in the United States of America happened under a lot of these revival preachers. And our country was shaped differently back in the 1950s through the preaching of men like John Rice. One, one time when he was preaching, a lady uh, came up to him at the service and she said, Dr. Rice, I just, you know, basically said, I feel so poorly, badly for you because I want you to have what I have. And he said, well, what is it that you have that I don't have? She said, well, I have, you know, the second blessing, the, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And uh, in other words, she was saying she could speak in tongues. And, uh, you know, his response was really that there's nothing more blessed, he didn't think, than to be able to preach the gospel and see thousands have their lives changed and come to know Jesus. But John the Baptist's response toward being charismatic was, or John the Baptist, John Rice's. <laughs> Thank you. John Rice's response about being charismatic, though, was this. He said, you know, the thing about it, though, is that if what the charismatics believe, if it's true, then I don't want any less of God than what someone else has. I want everything that God has for me. And, uh, you know, I feel the same way. In other words, I've done many things in my life that I'm very uncomfortable doing. For instance, speaking publicly. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't feel like, hey, I wish I just want to get up in front of everybody and talk. Now, I'm pretty comfortable speaking publicly because I've done it for a long time. But the reality of it is, is that it's not me. It's just not, I, that's my grandma. It's not me. I don't want to get up and speak publicly. But the reality of it is, is I'm called to do it. And so it's fine. I'm glad to do it and I have a blessing uh, from God from being able to do it. If speaking in tongues, if the babbling, if that were valid, and the Bible teaches it, it's what I want. Does everybody understand me this evening? In other words, I'm telling you what my personality would be like, but my personality has nothing to do with it. Truth is truth. You know, I go soul winning every week. Knock on people's doors, strangers' doors. Do you think that's my personality? To confront someone who doesn't know me about the gospel? To talk to somebody I know right from the beginning, this person is not looking for me to come by tonight and encounter them. And so right away, they don't like me before they've even met me. You think that feels good? Now, some people just enjoy it. But I don't mind calling someone a Trump supporter in Home Depot, but I don't want to knock on somebody's door and bother them. But I do. You know why? Because... It's the only way to preach the gospel to every creature. And I'm a gospel preacher. I've seen people come to know Jesus and their lives changed as a result of it. And I have to get outside my comfort zone every single week when I go. But I'm convinced that it's the right thing to do and I do it. Okay, so having said that, I would like us to be able to dispense with the notion this evening that being charismatic or not being charismatic about the gifts of the Holy Ghost has to do with what the Word of God teaches, not with what my preference is. And so all I want to see this evening is the diversity of spiritual gifts. And next Wednesday evening, we will specifically look at, we will specifically look at uh, the validity of speaking in tongues because a lot of people just think that's the only thing that spiritual gifts have to do with. Okay, so let's just look at a couple of things this evening in tonight's text, and next week we'll pick up and we'll get a good deal further. First of all, in verse 4, the Bible says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now that's pretty important, isn't it? You ever had somebody tell you someone said something, but you knew the person? Or somebody did something, but you knew the person? And you said, there's no way in the world that person said or did that, because I know them, they wouldn't do that. Well, that's the, one of the things that... Paul begins to say about God, God the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts. Now, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit of God gifts people different ways, but He's the same Spirit. Whereas He doesn't contradict Himself. He's consistent. 
And also, he may gift us differently, but the work or the purpose of God's Spirit is the same. Now, if you're taking notes this evening, uh, the question you ought to ask is, what is the work of the Holy Ghost? What is the work of the Holy Ghost? In other words, he gifts us. He supernaturally, divinely enables us to do things that we're not capable of in our own strength. And he does so for a purpose. What is his purpose? Well, if you want to discover that purpose sometime, read the book of Acts. Read what happens as soon as the power of Pentecost comes. In Acts chapter 2, when God's power comes on the 120 believers, and immediately what do they do? Well, the Bible says they began to speak with the tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Specifically, if you read Acts chapter 2, they spoke in the tongues of the Parthians, the Medes, the Persians, the Elamites, uh, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and every person heard them speak in his own language. What did they speak? The gospel. They preached that Jesus, whom they had crucified, God had raised him from the dead, and the conviction that the Holy Ghost gave the unbelievers there as a result of that was so that the Bible says they were pricked to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And what did Peter say? Repent. Repent and be baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost uh, for the remission of sins. And he said, The promise is unto you and unto your children and unto them that are afar off. So what is the work, that same work of the Holy Ghost? To preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. You may get, be gifted in a diverse manner. We ought to be gifted in a diverse way, shouldn't we? By the way, let me make one last point. This is as far as we're going this evening. Let me make one last point. Stop clustering or clumping up with spiritual gifts. This frustrates me to no end. Uh, <laughs> you have a guy, he's gifted as a teacher. He's really a good teacher. And he'll visit a church like ours and say, Yo, yo, your Sunday school's terrible. He said, when I'm teaching, not when Charlie's teaching. So your Sunday school's terrible. And uh, we're like, yeah, you know, we could really use a gifted Sunday school teacher in our church. We sure could. And uh, he'll leave and go to a church that has a lot better Sunday school class with better teachers. And then he'll sit in the pew and not teach because they don't need a teacher. They already have a lot of teachers. He wants to go to a church where people are like him. Somebody comes to a church and they're you know, they have the gift of giving and they have just, they're just gifted in that way. And they say, you know, your church just really lacks a lot. And so they'll go to a church that is well off and they'll go there and they'll give there because that's where they feel like, you know, they, these are my people. They look for people like themselves. You know, the Holy Ghost gifts us with diversity, not similarity. I don't need my wife to be like me. I need her to be like her, and I need me to be like me, right? Now, it's great if you get along, if you have similar hobbies and interests and some things in common, you know, but the reality of it is is that the things that are great about her, I'm not like at all. Her beauty, her femininity. Now, I know this beard's coming along, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, I need her to be beautiful. That's not my job in our relationship. And uh, But I want her to be and you understand, you know, God makes us different, doesn't He? And that's what makes marriage a great thing. You know, the friendships uh, of, a, of a husband and his wife are so special because of differences. Yeah, you can have a friend, and I mean, you're just alike, and you get along good, but what makes a marriage, what makes a really, really special friendship just amazing are the differences, the things that are different about you. My wife's organized. And I love that about her. I'm not. Uh, she's sweet. We're a lot alike in that way, I think. <laughs> probably. <laughs> but, uh, but the the con why there be that? I'm supposed to laugh when I'm making jokes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> anyway, the reality of it is, is that those are the things that make us fit together, isn't it? So why in the world do we go to a church and look for people just like us? Listen, if, if you go to a church and, yeah, you know, yeah, we don't want to be uncomfortable, but I think ultimately we, we're not so concerned about being used. You go to a church and you see people that are different there, that's a good thing. It means you're going to bring some balance to that place. You're needed there. 
You know, why do all the piano players all go to the same church? They do. Like 30 of them go to a church of 31 people. You know, they, they always have the pastor that can't sing. Right? Hey, Bellers is all he can do. And then they have like the 31, 30 musical people. You know, <laughs> it's, why, why is that? Well, because we don't understand spiritual gifts. The Bible says different and diverse. Now we're going to pick up there next week, but I want us to understand, first of all, this evening, the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Ghost is to do the work of the Holy Spirit. Do we understand that this evening? Whereas the purpose of the gifting of the believers with spiritual gifts is to do the work of the ministry, to work the work of the Holy Ghost. Ultimately, we know that purpose would be to preach the gospel, see people saved, and help them to grow. And God gives the church that way. The gifts are given in a diverse, different manner to every individual so that the whole church, according to verse 7, each individual and the church may profit with all. In other words, so we can all take advantage of it. What do you bring? What do you bring to the church? What do you add? What's missing when you're missing in the church? You say, well, Pastor, I, 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 don't, not, I don't know. Um, you ought to. You ought to because God made you with the purpose and your spiritual gift is an important purpose. And so that's what we'll pick up uh, next Wednesday evening. Now let's, let's uh, finish up our message with prayer tonight. Father, thank you for what we've gotten to this evening. And I just ask that you would help us to understand it and God to be eager to know what this supernatural empowering by your Spirit is for us. We praise you for it and to thank you for what we've learned tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's have a couple of minutes and take some prayer requests this evening.